You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can give at www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar helps advance the kingdom of God. We hope that this message edifies and encourages you to do the great things God has called you to do. Acts chapter 16, while you guys are getting there, I got to just tell you something. We're in the middle of a series called Focus. And uh, we're not in the middle of it. We're near the end of it. And I just have a few things I want to cover left. And uh, I almost broke this into two sermons because I got to give you this kind of caveat before we get into the, the sermon itself. The title is Character Over Circumstances. That's the title. Character Over Circumstances. Everyone look at one another and say, you better have good character. Yeah, hey, listen. So I decided I was going to preach on this uh, a few days ago. And I'm just going to tell you right now. I don't believe I have the character to even preach on this right now. I'm so convicted when I started studying for this sermon. I listened to another guy preach, and I went home that day, and I told Susie, Susie, I'm screwed up. I didn't get my life in order. Because character is extremely important. It's how you act, not just publicly, but privately. And we're going to talk about focusing in on our character and less about our circumstances. How many of you guys know somebody who's always talking about their circumstances? I know a lot of people like that. If you're not raising your hand, you might be that person, all right? I know people who talk about their circumstances all the time. I know people who, who and, and listen, I'm not shaming any of this. I'm just telling you things I know. I know people who go to counseling because of their circumstances, and that's all they want to talk about. I know people who are inhabilitated because of their circumstances. The things they've gone through has made it so they can't do anything else. I know people whose circumstances have defined them. I am this thing. They've taken on the identity of their circumstances. And today we're going to talk about having character in the midst of your circumstances. But before I get to that, i got to hit on something that's extremely important. It's kind of the baseline before we could get into what it means to have character. And it's this, it's this thing that um, I have to tackle in my personal life. How many of you guys were raised in the church? Anyone in here raised in the church? Come on, there's a lot of us. No, lift your hands up. I know you're cold, but you know, get some exercise. Yeah, there you go. Hey, listen, there's a lot of us who are raised in the church. And if you're raised in the church, you probably have heard this before. I don't want to be religious. Anyone ever heard that before? I don't want to be religious. I don't want to be someone who is justified by their works. Has anyone ever heard this before? Any any hard Christians in here? Me and Mario. Okay, check this out. And so we do this thing where uh, I I know I've done, I'm just going to use a quick example and then I'll I'll break it down real simple. Uh, I like to read my Bible. Actually, we might try that again. I don't like to read my Bible. But I know I should read my Bible. Is anyone in here with me on that? Sometimes I'm reading it, and I have a hard time reading it. Sometimes I'm reading it, and it's like, man, what the heck is that word? What is, why am I reading all these names? Matthew chapter 1, and Joseph begot this guy, and this guy begot this guy. It's like, okay, I want to skip Leviticus. You're just going through names, right? And sometimes I don't want to read the Bible. But I made a dedication when I was younger. I'm going to read the Bible every single day. And I'd read the Bible, I'd read the Bible, and then one day I would miss reading the Bible. You guys ever done this, right? And you miss reading the Bible, what happens? You feel guilty. And maybe it's not one day, maybe you go a whole week without reading the Bible. And all of a sudden you start feeling guilty. You start questioning, am I even a real Christian? And then what we do is we justify ourselves. And we say, you know what? It's not about Bible reading. It's about my relationship, my relationship with Jesus. Amen. And that's true. It's about your relationship with Jesus. And so what we do is then we dismiss this idea of daily doing things, right? I used to daily pray, but how many of you guys could confess, and it's okay, listen, I'm not going to throw no stones at you. How many of you guys could confess, you don't spend enough time in prayer? Anyone in this place could confess that? But we know we should, right? But what do we do? We go, oh, I should pray more, but that's not what this is about. This is about my relationship with Jesus. And so what we do is we dismiss it. And I've found this in my life, and I know I've found this in other people's lives, is that we are people who are not disciplined. Anyone in here want to be more disciplined? Anyone in here? How many of you guys want to wake up earlier? Anyone? Where's all my young people at? Yeah, don't you want to wake up earlier? You need to go to bed, dude. You told me you got home at 7 a.m. last night. Doing ministry, y'all. She wasn't out clubbing. But I want to be more disciplined. And so what we do is we start something. We talked about this last week. We'll start something in the new year. The gyms are always packed out. Every new year, Planet Fitness is packed out with new people, and they're all excited about working out. 
But what happens with that commitment? Eventually, they get too busy, right? February comes around, and there's other important things like sleep. I'm going to say this about my prayer life, because I do this all the time. I'll make a dedication. I'm going to pray every single morning. I want to be dedicated to it. And what I start doing is I start putting value to my Christianity based on my works. And all of a sudden, and I know this happens in this room, you value who you are in Christ by the way you act. And all of a sudden, you and I have a relationship with the Lord that we're always proving our value. I'm reading every day. I'm doing really good. It's been weeks since I sinned. I must be a really good Christian. And then all of a sudden, something happens. You slip up. You stop reading. You get out of habit. You cuss someone out for cutting you off on the street. And then all of a sudden, you found yourself, and you're going, I guess I'm not that good of a Christian. And so there's these two things that are happening inside of our heads. One part is, I'm not valued because of how I act. I don't want to be religious. And we have this other part is that we're always trying to prove that we really are Christians to God. And so we contradict ourselves. I want to wake up and read the Bible because I see it's a good thing to do, but I don't want to do it to prove myself. And so we end up not reading the Bible. You guys hear that clicking? I think a metrodome is going on over there. You guys hear that? Where's the drummers at? You got that count? Oh, it's the fog machine. Yeah, yeah we have a fog machine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we'll explain that later. <laughs> it gets crazy on Sunday nights here. No one knows about it, but there's a party. And I just want to hit on this. To those who are raised in the church, being religious means that you think that following the law is going to make you worthy. For those who weren't raised in the church, being religious means that you think that your works are what makes God look at you with approval. And I need to just debunk everything right now. The Lord saw you as valuable while you were still in your mess. And I got to say that to you right now. It says, while you are still a sinner, he sent his son for you. Your value was placed upon you before you even lifted your eyes to him. He saw you as something that he desired. He, in fact, sent his son to pay a price so he could have you. And now I'm saying this kind of strong because I know there's a lot of people in this room who go in and out of their Christian walk saying, I'm doing a good job and I'm doing a bad job because they're getting religious. They're saying, I am valued by my works. And you've got everything screwed up. And once you start figuring out, well, I'm not valued by my works, all of a sudden you stop doing weird things. You stop reading your Bible every day because that's not how God values you. You stop singing out loud. You stop praying because that's not how God values you. But I want to say this to you. Your prayer life is not a reflection of your value. You reading the Bible is not a reflection of your value. It's a reflection of how much you value Him. See, you don't go and wake up every morning to pray so you are a better Christian. Your Christianity is not based on that. Your Christianity is based on whether or not you believe that he paid the price and purchased you. It's whether or not you see his value. God, I will wake up every morning. I will spend my first hour with you regardless how tired I am. Not because it proves me, but because I know how good you are. So I want to get this baseline down for a second. When I talk about character, we're going to be talking, do you actually see God as worthy of your character? Can I say that one more time? Because I want to kind of hit on something that has me in tears. Because of my personal life. That my not reading the Bible isn't because of my Christianity isn't good enough, or I'm not that good of a Christian, but rather how I walk in this life and how I respond in circumstances is actually a reflection of how I see Him. So I want to nail something out. I hope you become religious people. I hope that you're so disciplined in your life that every morning you say, I can't start my day without reading and praying first. I hope that you're so disciplined that you won't gossip. I hope that you're so religious that you will show up and you'll be a part of the body of Christ because you say His bride is worthy. I hope you become so religious that you won't even watch a rated R movie. I hope you become that religious. 
Not because it's proving your value, but because you want to prove his value in your life. So I'm going to encourage you on something. Be more righteous than even the Pharisees. That's what Jesus says. But don't be righteous to prove yourself. Be righteous because you see him as worthy of your righteousness. So that's the baseline of having character over circumstances. So often, right, so often, everyone in here, wait, one stop, that was heavy, okay, that was heavy, and I'm going to start talking really fast, and I'm going to kind of change the mood, so can we do a little mood change really quick? Grab the person next to you and shake them real hard, there you go, not too hard, don't hurt someone, there's, you know, but say, there you go, there's shake them, hey, you too, David, you're by yourself, man, shake by yourself, buddy, there you go, there you go, thank you, Sylvia. And the reason why I want you to do that is because I want that thing to sink in on you. Hey, you ought to be religious, but not religious to prove your value. You need to be religious because his value is worth it. You hear me? No more justifying sin. No more justifying laziness. No more justifying I need a break. And a lot more of God, you're worthy even of my suffering. Amen? So now that we got that, because I didn't want to end on that, because we're going to get back to that, though. I need to talk to you about your circumstances. How many of you guys know someone? I'm always saying you know someone, because I know that if you're that person, you'll confess it, okay? But I don't want to put you on the spot. How many of you guys know someone who went through a crazy circumstance, and it changed who they are? Anyone in here? Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> don't point out people. That's my stuff. I know people. Hey, let's just be real. I've gone through circumstances that have changed me. How many of you guys got changed for the better? Anyone in here got changed for the better? Man, me too. How many of you guys got changed for the worse? You got jaded. You thought, man, I'm never going to see that. How many of you guys know people who won't go to church because they got offended at someone at church? You guys ever meet someone like that? Their circumstances did something. It changed their character. At least we think it changed their character. But I want to say this about your circumstances. Too often our focus is that we got to change our circumstances. Too often we're always saying, man, if I could just change this circumstance, life would be so much better. I mean, how many of you guys would like to change your circumstances? Anyone in here? I was just talking to someone today. I'm not going to say who it is, but man, this guy, I love him. He says, man, I just wish financially I could be in a different circumstance, that for one year I'd be set. Wouldn't that be awesome? Anyone in here? One year being set? Holy moly, dude. I don't know about you, but man, I, I, I would like to have uh, circumstances where I don't have to drive in traffic anymore on a Sunday, or on a Sunday, there's no traffic on Sundays, on a, on a weekday, I don't want to have to drive in traffic. I live in Conyers, Georgia, y'all. Do you even know that's a place in Georgia? Did you know that? That's a real place in Georgia. And I don't want to drive in traffic. I wish my circumstances would change. Man, I don't know about you, but I wish that I was even better at being a friend. I mean that. How many of you guys have ever called me before? You know I'm a bad friend. I won't answer your phone calls. <laughs> you just said that's right. I rebuke that little devil. <laughs> but circumstances, good and bad, are the revealing place of your character. Can I say that one more time? Circumstances, good or bad, are revealing of your character. The reason why most of us want to change our circumstances is because it's too hard on our character. I don't like the circumstance I'm in with my, my, my driving in traffic because I get so angry in traffic. I've told you guys this before, but I'm going to say it again. Now listen, I don't get road rage. I'm not screaming at people. But I'm the guy who cuts people off. Is anyone else in here that guy? Yeah? What's up, y'all? <laughs> we got places to go, places to be, right? Am I right? Yeah, we got things to do. But how many of you guys have ever recognized when you get cut off? Because this happens to me. When you get cut off, you hit that horn real hard. What are you doing, man? I wish I didn't have to sit in those circumstances where I get tempted. I want you guys to know, I get tempted all the time to be mean to people on the road. I do. I'll be driving and listen. I don't know if you live 20 east, but 20 east is a different world, okay? You get past Panola Road, all of a sudden, 90 miles per hour is in the slow lane, all right? You got to be going to 140, 150. You think I'm joking. It's not, I'm not joking. Have you guys ever drove down 20 East? Yeah, man. You guys ever go at nighttime and the motorcycles all of a sudden out of nowhere? That's scaring me while I'm driving, man. It's insane. Guys, I don't need to talk about the 20. That's not what I'm here for. But legit, guys, I don't know how cars even fit. Like changing lanes, I'll be like two feet and there'll be like a 
a, a truck with an eight-foot bed somehow squeezes right through there and doesn't touch either one of us. It's just, wrong. It's insane. <laughs> but in those circumstances, when I'm getting cut off or can I actually go a little bit further? When you're in a bad relationship, I'm not talking about marriage, Eve. I'm just talking about friendship. Or you're in a bad work environment. Oftentimes, we're looking to change our circumstances when God really wants us to focus in on our character. How are you acting in the midst of your circumstances? See, oftentimes, and I, I believe this, God will have us go through multiple circumstances because we're too busy looking at our surroundings and not busy enough looking at how we're acting in the midst of it. And he wants us to be revealed. How many of you guys know, I said this earlier, but circumstances reveal character. How many of you guys have ever been in a good place before? Anyone ever been in a good place? I've been in a place where I felt so good and happy. I just walked around a little skip of my step, you know, feeling good. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen the swag before. <laughs> in the midst of feeling so good, I lost my discipline. My character changed. All of a sudden, I'm sleeping in. I don't want to pray in the morning. Things are so good. My character was revealed. I only pray when things are hard. But what about when things are hard? Man, this is maybe the more revealing times for a lot of us. Someone's mean to you. I'm saying mean. That's such a weak word for how people have treated you in the past. Mean to you. How about this? Try to be against you. Try to ruin you. And how do you react? What's your character? I know my character. I've been in bad circumstances. First thing I do is I go home and I tell my wife and then I try to tell someone else about it too. Can you believe what so-and-so said to me? You know, I think they're doing this. And what comes out of my character in a bad circumstance? Gossips. Gossips. It's sad. So how do we focus in on our character? How do we become people who say, you know what, no matter my circumstances, every time the circumstance is fantastic, it's amazing, and I'm on top of the world, I still stay the same. How do I have my character be molded where I am someone worthy of God? How does it become that my circumstances don't dictate who I am, but rather who I am dictates how my circumstances become? How do we get there? Well, I'm going to tell you just a few quick stories. You guys down for that? In the book of Acts, Acts 16, I love this circumstance. Peter and Silas, these two dudes are out ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many guys wish that you would be out ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm saying that because I'm going to ask you guys a real tough question. Don't raise your hand. Don't need to answer it. When's the last time your one thing you were doing was ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ? Think about that for a second. It wasn't an add-on. It wasn't happenstance, but it was your agenda. This was their agenda. We're going to go show God's goodness. Well, they get caught up. Check this story out. <laughs> this is a crazy story. I actually love this story. Now, it happened as we, this is Paul and Silas, went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit for, by fortune telling. In other words, there's this little girl who had a demon in her who could prophesy. And it was telling people about their past and their lives. And it said, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed. I want to stop there for a second. I want you to know, even the famous people in the Bible got greatly annoyed. Isn't that good news, huh? How many of you guys have ever been greatly annoyed? Look at all these parents. Shame on you for talking about your kids like that. I'm just kidding. So this is what's happening, just so you guys are clear. There's a demon-possessed girl who has a spirit of divination upon her. She's following around Paul, and she's proclaiming. These people are proclaiming the way of Jesus. And Paul gets greatly annoyed because she won't shut it. So he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the spirit came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the, the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. 
Then the multitude arose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had made, laid many stripes, that's a nice way of saying when they beat the heck out of them, when they put many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Let me talk about this circumstance. This is an insane circumstance. I guarantee none of you have ever experienced this kind of circumstance. Imagine this. You're out preaching the gospel. You're telling the good news. Can I just tell you for a second what Jesus did for me? It was so good. And there's this lady behind you. I don't know if you've ever done ministry. But sometimes when you're out doing ministry, some weird things start happening, Okay. You guys know what I'm talking about? Micah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know Micah knows what I'm talking about. Me and Micah had some weird experiences together. This is one of those weird experiences. There's this little girl following him around. I could just imagine how annoying she was for days. These guys know Jesus! (laughs) It's like, okay, thanks, honey. The next day, these guys know Jesus! They know him! Finally, Paul's so annoyed. Knowing that's not the spirit of the Lord, rebukes the spirit out of her. He does something great. Do you know how excited you would be if you saw someone demon-possessed and you cast out a demon out of them, you guys would be at church on a Wednesday night giving testimonies. I saw a demon-possessed person and it came out. Circumstances are great. And when it happened, when he does something really good, he does something amazing and it flipped on him. How many of you guys have ever done something good and it came out bad? How many of you guys got real upset about that? Now, I've done good things that everyone thought was bad before. Not everyone, okay? You know, it's not like I, I'm not that cool. But I've done things where people thought I had bad intentions. I was so mad. You guys know what I'm talking about? And then you, you start talking about them. Oh, I don't have bad They have bad intentions. Yeah. It turns out bad for them. These guys end up getting beat. Beat. I'm not talking about like with rods. It's insane. I, I should have brought a rod. I don't got a rod, but I got a stick. Check this out. I don't got a stick. I got a, I got a microphone stand. Eli, is this okay to do? Thanks. Now, a rod wasn't metal like this, and this actually wouldn't hurt so bad, but imagine, you know, you're not a child no more. You guys ever pull a spanking spoon on a kid, or did you ever get a spanking as a kid? Anyone in here get a spanking as a kid? Remember when they pull that stick, and you would start crying before mom would hit you? <laughs> Some of y'all are too young. We're in a different world. Isn't that true? <laughs> So you're like, oh my gosh, you used to get hit. Like, oh, no, we, it was more than a hit. <laughs> yeah, switches. Ooh. And listen, I didn't get the switch. I was new when I came out here. I did not know about the switch. You guys in the South, you guys live in a different world. <laughs> ah, that's messed up. All right, all right, yeah. Now, as a child, that's terrifying. And listen, I, 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 I'm not going to be shy with you guys. I give my kids spankings. Not for any reason. When they're misbehaving, I'll pop them on the leg. And can I tell you how hard I have to pop them to make them cry? <laughs> Seriously, every time. Every time. If you, if you do spankings to your kids, that's all it takes. Holiday, I can say holiday. <laughs> every time. But these are grown men with rods, sticks. When I say a rod, don't think switch. Think about where you got that switch from, that big old branch. And these rods would usually be shaped up with a nice little circle on the end to give you a nice big bruise. And it says that they went over to those men and they beat them. Bop, bop. But I want you to stop for a second. We read stories like they're fairy tales. We never put the emotion into the circumstance. Imagine you are doing the right thing and someone comes over, not someone, the town comes over and beats you with rods. You would be sitting there thinking, what did I do to deserve this? I would be personally crying out, God, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Save me. Help me. Make them go blind. Don't let me get hurt anymore. My heart, for me personally, if I was in that position, I would be thinking, how do I get out of this circumstance? But this is what happens. Now they're in prison. For what? Saving some little girl from a demonic spirit that tormented her? 
But how did they act? At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Can I tell you? I don't think anywhere in the scripture it indicates they were praying for salvation. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that here in just a second. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. After getting beat and being in prison, they're praying. They're not licking their wounds in prison. They're not calling up somebody and saying, I just need to talk to you because that's what's going on. They're in there praying and singing. Singing. I, I, I don't know if I, if I were in the guards who were listening to them, the prisoners who were listening to them, I'll be looking at them going, these guys must be crazy. Their circumstances are too bad for a character like that. That's unheard of. But what happens? I love this. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. Can I say that again? All the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Not just theirs, but everybody in that prison. All of a sudden, the doors are open. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors were all open, supposing that the prisoners had fled. This is before electricity. It's dark in that room. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul caught up with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Did you know Paul had an opportunity to have the man who put him in prison, it was probably part of the beating, to die? But his character said, don't do it. I don't need to see my Lord's vengeance upon you just yet. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately, and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officer saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, hey, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, I love this, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans. <laughs> they have thrown us into prison. Now they do not put us out secretly. No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. And kicked them out of the city is basically what it gets down to. So they left the prison, the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brother, they encouraged them and departed. I love this last part, and they encouraged them and departed. Because this is what the story is saying. Paul's character and Silas's character was above their circumstances. And their circumstances didn't dictate how they acted, but rather how they acted dictated their circumstances. Now I want to say to you in this room, how you act in the middle of your circumstance is an indicator how your circumstances are going to change. How many of you guys have found yourself complaining in the middle of your circumstances? How many of you guys have noticed it doesn't change? But how many of you guys have ever said, I don't know what, in the middle of this terrible time, I'm going to praise the Lord. In the middle of this terrible time, I'm going to sing songs. In the middle of this terrible time, I'm going to encourage others. In the middle of this time, I'm going to love the person who beat me. How many of you guys have seen those circumstances change? Well, let me tell you something right now. If you just decide to look at your character more than your circumstances, you could change your circumstances. Isn't that good news? Well, there's a million more stories. I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to rush through them. You guys okay with that? Gideon. Trust in the Lord. He believed that the Lord was good. Against all odds, if you don't know the story, go read Judges chapter 6. Against all odds, he defeated enemies with only 300 men. Enemies of 20,000, 30,000, 300 men. His circumstances didn't dictate him, but his character. I believe God could do this. Another one, I love this one. Daniel. You guys know Daniel the Lion's Den? How many of you guys went to kids' church, man? Daniel the Lion's Den. That's one of the best stories out there. No? Okay. You know why Daniel went to, into the lion's den? Because his character was, I'm going to pray three times a day, every day. I will not stop. That's who I am. 
And every day he would go up to his room, open up the windows, and he would pray. And when his circumstances changed, he had favor, things were good, he prayed. It became a day where it was against the law to pray. Guess what? His character didn't change. He said, I will still pray. Because I find Jesus worthy of my praise. What does he do? He prays. What happens? You guys know the story. He gets thrown into a lion's den for praying to someone outside of the King Darius. He gets thrown in that lion's den. What happens to that lion's den? You guys don't need to tell me that story. He lives. Why? Because he put character over his circumstances. And lastly, this is, this is, I have a million more stories like this, guys, but I love this one. I was actually going to read this one to you. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph was betrayed by his family. I'm going to tell you right now, if this happened today, the majority of the church would not encourage him to have a good character. We would encourage him to go through counseling to fix his issue with his brothers. You know what Joseph did? When he was a slave, his character outshone everybody else. He became the most important slave in that household. His circumstances of being a slave didn't decide how he was going to act. He decided, I will have character over my circumstances. He gets falsely accused of being a rapist, and he goes to prison. While he's in prison, do you know what he becomes? He becomes the prisoner in charge of all the other prisoners. Why? Because his character was greater than his circumstances. You know what happens after that? Because of his great character and trusting in the Lord, finding that he was worthy, he's put in second position from prison to second position in Egypt. And guess who he has to face? His siblings, the ones who betrayed him, show up. And do you know what he says to them? He doesn't look at them and go, you really screwed up my life. He never says that. How many guys would say that? How many guys would be boiling inside? Can I just be real? I'm asking you a question because some of y'all got problems with your parents. And you really feel like they screwed up your life. You let the circumstance dictate your character and your character not over your circumstances. Some of y'all got problems with friends you thought betrayed you. Joseph got betrayed worse than you ever could imagine. Listen, some of us got betrayed because someone, like, you know, didn't pay his back or something, you know? Like, oh, that jerk. They talked bad behind my back. Joseph got beat up and slaved into sl sold into slavery. He got betrayed. But he didn't let that color the way he saw his brothers. His character was greater than the circumstances. It says that when his brothers showed up, he was taken back, but then he cries before them. In fact, while he sitting with them the first few days, he was so overwhelmed, he would go cry in the corner by himself. So overwhelmed. And when he finally reveals himself, you know what he says? He says, do not feel guilty for what you've done to me, for the Lord has placed me here. Not you. For the Lord, my, his character was, God is worthy of my character. Even when you screw me over, I will not change my character. My God is in control. It changed the way he even saw the ones who wanted him dead. He became their salvation. But what about if your circumstances aren't just because of random? Because I'm going to be honest with you, most of y'all aren't in circumstances that just happen to you. How many of you guys know most of your circumstances are because you got yourself into trouble? Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's usually the problem, right? And I got a bunch of people. I'm just going to run through this really bad, uh, really quick. Some bad people. David committed adultery and murdered a man. He put himself in a terrible position. Those circumstances went from he was the greatest to he was the worst. How many of you guys have ever experienced a fall before? Anyone ever experienced a fall before? He went from the greatest king, people singing his praises, to a man who murdered a man who was loyal and loved him. One of his mighty men. A Hittite. David put himself in a bad position. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, I want to read this really quick. It's a small little verse. I got like a uh, it's a couple verses, like eight verses. David is in a bad circumstance that he put himself in, like a lot of us in this room do. You screw around with your finances. I know people who have gambled and lost so much of their life. I know people who have cheated on spouses. I know people who have done 
terrible, foolish things. How many of you guys know that God forgives you of your sins and He forgets, but you don't forget? Terrible things, and you thought, well, I must be disqualified. I'm no good. My circumstances, I brought them upon myself. Surely this will change my character. Well, this is what David does. A man after God's own heart. He screws up. He puts himself in a pretty bad pickle. And he says to Nathan, the prophet, who has exposed his sin, because just so you guys know, get a little glimpse of this, David kept the sin secret that he murdered someone for about a year. One year. Uh, Actually, I take that back. Like nine months, ten months. And Nathan the prophet comes and exposes them. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then he said to David, the Lord also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blasphemy. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. So David ended up having a baby with a woman he had adultery with. He ended up marrying her after he killed her husband. And Nathan said, that baby is going to die. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted. And he went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. Could you imagine the pressure that someone's praying that something wouldn't happen? Can I use you for a second? Come here, come here, come here. I want you to, you're dressed so nice. I should have dressed someone, got someone who wasn't so nice looking. Hey, come up here, Rashawn. Rashawn, I want you to just bow down right here like you're praying. Imagine this guy has a baby who's dying, and he's at the altar crying out to the Lord, don't let my baby die, don't let my baby die. And all these people, (laughs) he doesn't have a kid, he doesn't get it. And the baby dies, and you have to bring the news to him. (laughs) The teenagers. (laughs) Teenagers got no shame, man. And that's what they're saying. They were afraid to tell him. They were looking at him and going, his character... I've seen a man who's killed nations off. This man's a warrior. I don't want to be the one to tell this guy that his baby's dead. And this is the thing. David is in this circumstance because he put himself there. He's the one who murdered the girl, the husband, Uriah. He's the one who stole the girl, got her pregnant, kept it secret for so long. He's the reason why his child is cursed by God. But you know what he does? He doesn't wallow in his sin. You know what he does instead? He prays and he fasts to the Lord. And this is what happens. They said, while the child is alive, we spoke to him and he wouldn't heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child has passed? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yeah, he, he's, he's dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. Thank you, bro. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wet for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and you ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me, as in I will die, but he will not come back to life. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, so she bore another son and called his name Saul. Then. Now the Lord loved him. And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet, so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. David put himself in the worst possible circumstance. He screwed up so bad. I'm going to say this in this room. These people have screwed up so bad. You're pretty positive God's not going to do you any more favors. I know people who sometimes sin and won't go back to the Lord for a week or two. I actually know people who won't come to church because they feel like they've screwed up so badly in their circumstances. They say, I'm not worthy of it. But I want to say this about David's character. He put himself in a bad position 
But he chose to be someone who said, I will still fast and pray even though I'm in this position. My character over my circumstances. Peter denies Jesus three times. And the Lord had already told him, those who deny me, I will deny before my father. And what happens with Peter? In the midst of his circumstances, he sits with Jesus still. I know I screwed up, but I'm going to sit with you still. He becomes a great apostle of the scriptures. Paul, he's a man who seriously is known for killing people like you and I. His circumstances are he's not trusted. What does he do? For 10 plus years, his character is proven. I now believe in Jesus. I want to say this about your circumstances. If you're focused on changing them, you're missing the point. You should be focused on how you're acting in the midst of them. Your circumstances reveal who you are. But how do I have the character that I know I'm supposed to have? Like, once this, this is the easiest thing. I already hit on it. We're going to end on this. This is where I'm landing. How in the world do you and you and you and you and you and you and you walk this thing out with great character in the midst of your circumstances? Because I think everybody in here wants to have the good character. I think everyone in here wants to be the person who when you get slapped on one cheek by your enemy, you're willing to turn the other. I think everyone in here is when you get cut off, you don't want to be tempted to use that middle finger. I think everyone in here wants to be the person who's not afraid to share the gospel with people you know. I think everybody in here wants to have the character that people look at you and go, this person obviously knows the Lord. Even in your worst circumstances, how do you become that person? There's only one way, and it's not by more prayer. It's not by studying your Bible anymore. It's by recognizing that God is worthy of your character, worthy of the way that you act. Because you can sit here all day and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be mean to these people, but it's going to boil out of who you are. The only way you'll ever be someone who has character over your circumstances, someone who walks the life out correctly, no matter what is going on around you, you have to be someone who sees, says and sees, God, you are worthy. You are worthy that I won't gossip. God, you are worthy that I will still pray even if it means I'm going to die. God, you are worthy that I would even get beat for you. You know what it means to be worthy? It means worth it. it means valuable. You and I, if we want to have character in the midst of our circumstances, we have to be people who say, God, I see your value. And I never want to risk it. Because I think, to be honest with you, the reason why, and I, I, maybe I'm talking to myself, maybe I'm in a church where you guys are way more holy than I am, and I, I'm okay with that. But I just have this feeling that a lot of us are dictated by what's going on around us. And we're so consumed by what people have said and they think. And we're so consumed by what's going on in our, our situations that we start acting a certain way. I know people who've given, given up their integrity so they can have more money. I know people who've done things because they didn't feel loved, so they did things against their husbands and wives. And it's always the same thing. They don't believe that God is worthy enough to actually live this life out. There's a scripture, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. He says, man, the kingdom of God is like a man who he finds a treasure hidden in a field. And he sees the value of it. And he goes home and he sells everything that he has. Everything. Not just enough. He says, it's so valuable, 
I will sell everything I worked for, everything that I own, everything that was given to me, everything. I will sell it all because the value, the worth of his kingdom is so great. I don't want anything else. I don't want protection from harm even. I will sell it all because he is worthy. Like it doesn't matter if it means I have to get beat by rods. He's worthy. I will preach his name. It doesn't matter if I lose my position. He is worthy of my praise. It doesn't matter if I never feel loved again. He is worthy of my character. It doesn't matter what they've done to me. I don't act the way I act because of how people treat me. I act the way I act because he is worthy of my actions. The truth is, your character deficit isn't because of a lack of discipline. It's a lack of understanding how worthy he is. Where you're sinning isn't because you stayed up too late last night or you don't have enough blocks on your phone. It's because you don't know how worthy he is. Your anger at other people who have treated you wrong isn't because of how they treated you. You've been mad at people who have treated you kindly. It's because you don't know that he's worthy of your actions and your heart. And I'm going to do something today because I preached for a long time and I'm, I, I'm, I'm not offended that I did that. I'm happy that I did because I just got to get something to you. You need to make an adjustment in your life. And it's not just your disciplines. I didn't get into that. It's your view on God. Listen, I, I got to say this. I am torn inside because we've become apathetic with who God is. Where he could be in the room with us right now. We shrug our shoulders and say, oh. We sin. Oh, we sin. We actually go against God. And we go, not that bad. Apathetic means that you don't care when it's actually important. And I've realized in my own heart that where I lack in character is where I lack perspective of who God is because the man who saw how good the treasure was would sell it all but so many of us are in here who are fighting the Lord saying Lord I don't want to give you these things I was talking to someone and it's funny I said but what would you do if you truly saw God as he was she said but I can't live that way I would would have to give up everything I'd have to give him my home and my car. I can't see him that worthy because it's going to cost me everything. And so what we've done in the church as a nation is we've become, what the Bible says, lukewarm. People who are okay to walk in their sin, to walk without prayer, to not even study who God is. To not even open up our Bibles. But we've become apathetic, not even caring. And being consumed, rather, by things that don't even matter. And because of this, His worthiness, how we see His worth, has been diminished to how we act on our own. We say, oh, God's good, and I want to praise Him. But I don't read my Bible enough, and all of a sudden it's become self-centered. I just want to push you, church, for a second. I want to do something we never do. We don't do enough. I want to open up these altars, these old benches. People have been saved on these things. People have stained these with tears. But there's something I know that we don't do and I never give an opportunity for. It's a moment for you to come to this altar and sit before the Lord. I'm just going to be honest with you to repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I forgot your worth. 
I've let my circumstances dictate me. I know what your scripture says, but I've so often said, but this is what's happening. This isn't the same. You diminish the value of who God is in your life. And today I want to open up these altars and just give you an invitation to be on your face for a few. And say, God, I need the revelation again. I remember when I wanted to sell everything for you. I would give up everything for you. But now I have a hard time giving up my sleep for you. But now I have a hard time giving you just a couple minutes in a day. I forgot your value. So for the next who knows how long, the altars are open for anyone who's ready to say, God, I need to change how I see you. Cause me to be someone who can't live without prayer. Cause me to be someone who knows that you're so worth it that your Bible, the Word of God, I got to eat it. I got to be in it every day. The altars where the people are saying, I, I, I've been diminished who you were. You're just, I've, I've become apathetic. I don't want to recognize you when you're in the room anymore. The altars are for the people who are going, I, I know you're worth more, but I forgot when you reveal it to me again. Oh, some of you guys are going, I, I just, this is the other side of it. Some of you guys don't think you're worthy of God. I got to say this. He thought you were worthy before you even put your eyes on him. You're worthy. But is he worthy of your character? Gideon knew God's power, so his character didn't change. Daniel knew the importance of his prayer life with his Lord, so his circumstances didn't change him. Peter and Silas knew the value of Jesus, so even when they were beat, they still worshiped and sang praises. Joseph saw the value of Jesus, even though it was yet to be prophesied. He saw the value. He loved his brothers. In his room, some of you guys haven't forgiven people because you're still caught up in what they did, but you don't see the value of Jesus. He's worthy of you forgiving. Father, I pray over the church a breaking of the spirit of apathy. Got a breaking of this just, uh, I don't know, it's not that important. Father, I pray right now a breaking, Father, of the importance, Jesus, of establishing ourselves on this earth. I pray for a breaking right now, God, from the mindset that our finances are more important than our relationship. Oh God, I pray right now, Father, you break right now, Father, the spirit that's lied to us, who's called us out of ministry and out of the works of you. God, I pray against the spirit of apathy. God, I pray that you awaken the church. Father, I pray over everyone today in this room that Jesus, we would find you again. That God, the value of you would be greater than what we've put it at. Father, I pray over every one of us. God, I didn't get into this much, but God, I pray that you reveal how you see us, that you value us. You didn't value us because we were doing good. You valued us because we are your creation. So, Father, may we value you because you are our creator. I pray right now over everyone in this room, Jesus, that, Father, you reveal yourself to us. And, God, I pray blessings over everyone in this room, that, Jesus, today they could walk in the holiness of you. Today, God, they can walk in a way of discipline that even their circumstances won't dictate, God, how they act. But, Father, they would be led by you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. We hope that you enjoyed today's sermon. Once again, if you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com to help us advance the kingdom of God. And check us out on the Church Center app and all your favorite social media platforms. Until next time, be blessed and go do the great things God has called you to do.